In the world of Hollywood, few stars have burned as brightly as Judy Garland. But behind the camera, her life played out like a tragedy. From being fed pep pills, sleeping pills, and diet pills at the age of 12 by her mother, to being forced to sing on the radio the night her father lay dying. Few Hollywood stories are as tragic as that of Judy Garland, a girl who was called by the head of the studio his little hunchback. She never found herself beautiful. A lifelong addiction to drugs that began when she was a child, a series of disastrous marriages, numerous suicide attempts, and a deep insecurity that haunted her whole life. From being one of the top paid stars in the world to in the end, needing to perform at piano bars and nightclubs just to survive. Her talent and voice continue to touch the hearts of millions. From the hopeful innocence of Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, to being an inspiration for a character in Valley of the Dolls, to her Oscar-nominated performance in A Star is Born, which was sabotaged by her very own studio. Garland's life was a paradox. Adored by millions, she still felt profoundly alone, exploited by an industry that saw her more as a commodity than a human being. Yet every time she stepped on stage or in front of a camera, she was nothing short of magical. Over the Join us this week as we look at the heartbreaking tale of Judy Garland. Judy Garland was born in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, to a musical family. Her mother, Ethel, played the piano, and her father, Frank, sang during silent pictures at the theater he owned. She was the third and youngest girl and an unwelcome surprise. When Ethel found out she was pregnant, she did everything she could to induce a miscarriage, including drinking castor oil. When this failed, her husband asked a local doctor to help with an abortion. The doctor refused, fearing it might cost Ethel her life. He told Frank, I want you to go home and tell Ethel she is going to have this child and this child is going to be the happiest baby in the world. With no options left, Ethel gave birth and on June 10, 1922, Francis Ethel Gum, who everybody called baby, was born. As much as she had been unwanted at first, her parents showered her with affection, especially her father who worshiped her, and baby reciprocated with a small, passionate heart. Every night before he would go off to the theater, she would get in her pajamas and sit on his lap as he sang Danny Boy. It was my bedtime ritual, said Judy. Her two older sisters performed on stage at the theater, and it wasn't long until Baby joined them. On December 26th, when she was just two years old, she joined her sisters on stage for the first time. Baby stole the show, singing Jingle Bells. It met with such rapturous applause that she sang it again and again and again, until her father finally had to carry her off the stage. Applause is the best music in the world. Judy once said. The sisters were known as the gumdrops, but almost immediately, Baby was the star, with her voice that captured the hearts of the theater goers. Judy would always recall this time in Minnesota as the happiest in her life. But the period of tranquility was not to last. Her father was bisexual and had a penchant for young boys, and after his involvement with a high school basketball player, advances towards theater ushers, he was forced to sell the theater and moved to Lancaster, California. There, Frank purchased another theater in the Mojave Desert, and Baby and her sisters were the local stars. People simply could not believe that such a powerful voice could come out of the mouth of a child. As a friend said, it was as if her voice had been touched by magic. Soon, Ethel began looking beyond their city to Hollywood for her daughters, and the group began to appear on radio stations in Los Angeles. Baby's first foray into film, a one-reel short, The Big Review, where she performed with her sisters, revealed her natural camera presence and ability to captivate audiences. As her fame grew, bookers began specifically requesting Baby to perform, and by nine she was singing at the prestigious Coconut Grove. 
Whatever Frank's other problems were, he adored his daughter, and the feeling was mutual. Her relationship with her mother, however, was far more complicated. Ethel was determined to make Baby a star, not allowing her to participate in many games with the local children, and always making sure Babe looked impeccable. People in Lancaster speculated that Ethel viewed Babe more as an asset than as a child to be loved. Every Saturday, her mother would drive her down to the studios for auditions, giving her commands during the ride on what to do and what not to do. Babe hated these days. She would perform for unresponsive studio executives, and then her mother would make her wait outside for two hours after, where Judy later said she believed these meetings involved sexual favors. Though no proof of this exists, the way home was much worse, as her mother would tell her all the things she had done wrong, as Babe cried in the car. It was at this point, when Babe was nine, that her mother started giving her pep pills and sleeping pills, saying, I've got to keep these kids going. When her father tried to step in and put a stop to it, Ethel would grab Babe and threaten to leave him, sometimes taking Babe away for days at a time. When Babe would cry and say she wanted to stay with her dad, her mother would simply say, it means you don't love me. As Frank and Ethel's fights grew worse, Babe started suffering from insomnia and her hands began to shake. At this point, Ethel began having an affair with their neighbor, Will Gilmore, whose wife was in a wheelchair after suffering a stroke. Ethel's lover would criticize Babe for her appearance and insult her at every opportunity. He was a terrifying man, I loathed him, Judy said later. In 1933, Ethel moved the family to Los Angeles, seeing Frank only on weekends. Babe attended Lawler's School for Professional Children, a school catering to young performers, where afternoons were reserved for auditions. Mickey Rooney, a fellow student, called the school a facade with little real education. When Babe sang Blue Moon at an assembly, she received a standing ovation, impressing even the movie star Baby Peggy, who was in attendance. Her long separations with her father were hard, sometimes not seeing him for weeks. Whenever she was doing a show within a few hundred miles, he would drive there and watch his girls perform, with tears running down his cheeks. He argued that the girls should not be driving around the country, that it was unsafe, but he lost the fight with Ethel. I hated leaving him, Judy said later. I used to pretend when we were gone that he wasn't there, as if I thought about it, it just hurt so much. During one tour, they encountered the Andrews sisters. Seeing the gums as rivals, the Andrews sisters initially locked them out of the studio space. However, one morning after hearing Babe sing, they relented and the sisters grew to adore the young Babe. When the Andrews sisters lost their gig at the Oriental Theater, they tipped off Babe and the sisters auditioned. The MC George Jessel was unimpressed by her sisters, but mesmerized by Babe. However, he disliked the surname Gum and suggested Garland inspired by his friend, the critic Robert Garland. Ethel agreed and the Garland sisters were born with Babe as the star. Back in LA, the trio performed at the Orpheum and Grauman's Chinese Theater. Critics singled out Babe, praising her as class entertainment. A drama critic even compared her to the great Bernhardt, recognizing Judy's instinctual ability to be herself on stage. With his family gone, Frank became more overt with young boys, and soon the whole town knew, and people would hurl slurs at him as he walked down the street, and he was forced to sell the theater and move to Los Angeles to be with his daughters. Still in 1935, Judy was no closer to being a movie star. All the major studios had turned her down, she didn't have the cuddly cuteness of a Shirley Temple and could not play teenage roles. Studio executives referred to her as Huckleberry Finn, saying there were no parts in films for such a girl. In the summer of 1935, she renamed herself Judy after a hokey Carmichael song about a girl with a voice as fresh as spring, and she would never answer to Babe or Francis again. And it was for Judy Garland that Hollywood opened its doors. On her third audition with MGM, she impressed the singing director so much that he set up a meeting with Mr. Mayer, the head of the studio. When she sang Ali Ali, his eyes glistened and she was given a seven-year contract for $100 a week. 
Judy was now given more local radio appearances, and two weeks after signing the contract, she was to appear on a nationally syndicated radio show. Just prior to going on the air, she was handed the phone. Her father had been taken to hospital. She was told he was gravely ill and that a radio had been placed by his bedside so he could hear her. Her mother insisted Judy still perform, and Judy Garland, as she phrased it, sang her heart out, knowing it was the last time her father would ever hear her. Here is some of that radio broadcast from 1935, when Judy was 12. Her father died the next day, which was also her mother's birthday. Ethel showed no emotion or concern and had little time for her daughters. She left the children in the care of her friends for the next three days as she went off with her lover, Will Gilmore. At the funeral, Judy was inconsolable. As people walked up to pay their respects to Frank, she would shout that the casket should be closed. Tell them not to stare at daddy, tell them to go away. Judy later said, that his death was the most terrible moment in her life. Within two months, she had gained everything, but lost what she had treasured most. Weak and flawed though he was, Frank loved her as no one ever had or ever would again. Now, she said, I have no one on my side. As we leave the poignant beginnings of Judy Garland's life, we are reminded of the stark contrasts between her dazzling public persona and the private battles she endured. Her journey from a young, vibrant voice in Minnesota to the turbulent gates of MGM is a tale of rare talent shadowed by profound challenges. Yet, Judy's resilience and her ability to captivate audiences with her magical performances remained undiminished. Join us next week as we dive deeper into Judy's story during her MGM years, where her star rose to iconic status amidst trials that tested her spirit and strength. We'll explore her breakthrough roles and the making of classics like The Wizard of Oz and Meet Me in St. Louis, which cemented her legacy in the annals of Hollywood, as well as her struggles with self-image, addiction, and the exploitation of a studio that employed even her own mother as a spy. Thanks for watching. If you like content like this, please like, share, and subscribe.